Pints with Jack, Season 4, Episode 15. The Screwtape Letters, Letter 9, Danger Zone. Welcome, everyone. Pints with Jack is your weekly C.S. Lewis podcast, where David, Andrew, and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This season, we are eavesdropping on the correspondence of a senior demon, Screwtape, as he explains how to tempt the patient, a human assigned to his nephew, a demon named Wormwood. Each week, we'll be considering a different letter, untwisting Screwtape's hellish logic, and forming a battle plan for our own spiritual lives. So, David, it is good to be back. It is. It's it's just you know I do enjoy I love these these co-host dynamics these guest dynamics but you know there's just there's a comfort in just coming home I feel like I'm home with you David <laughs> it is nice to get the original team back together actually earlier this week I was having a look to our RSS feed so that's our main podcast feed do you want to have a guess how many episodes we have now released uh, this season or since we started the show since we began this. Well, I mean, we're doing now averaging more than 50. I'm going to go with 200. Yeah, 200. That was way too much. <laughs> really? We have released 157. But we have had 270,000 downloads so far. Wow. Okay, that wasn't too far off, by the way. <laughs> I do forget it's going to go exponentially because now we're starting to do probably six a month rather than four a month which I love. I really love, and I hope you listeners, you guys like it too. I love how David this season decided to keep the routine pace of Tuesdays, but then throw after hours on Thursdays. That was just a brilliant idea. It, 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 it honestly pleases everyone because if there's some people who just really like the cadence of the book, perfect. You get it, but you still get to tuck in tons of after hours. And David is sure taking advantage of that. <laughs> and we actually have had some people say that they actually preferred the after hours uh, one guy on the Slack channel was saying, yeah, season two wasn't bad, but I mainly just listened to the After Hours episodes. Yeah, I mean, honestly, <laughs> this is terrible. Listeners don't see this, but we kind of, when we when we started doing the After Hours after Till We Have Faces, is again when it started to really uptick with our subscriber base. I think that After Hours are very easy. They're just easy to jump into. You can take them and leave them as you want. You learn some cool insights. It's just, they're just less commitment, and we know we are a society that doesn't love commitment. <laughs> Uh, speaking of commitment, oh, that's a wonderful transition. <laughs> when I was about 10 years old, so this was 1990, uh, I took the dyslexia test at school and I passed with flying colors. Uh, so what that meant was that I had extra English classes most Wednesdays. And I, for most of the time I had one teacher, her name was Penny Porteous. She reached out to my mother this past week. Uh, I just want to read you the email. Dear Angela, I hope you are keeping well in these difficult times. I've been clearing out some papers and things, and I found two poems by David which I thought you would like. I think they're lovely. He wrote them in 1992 when I was encouraging him to write poetry in the Japanese style, which is very short. So this is a former teacher of mine sending my mother two haikus that I had written when I was 10 years old. So I just thought since Matt banned me from doing haikus normally during the season, I just wanted to share two that I wrote a while ago. Here's the first one. Water rushing through my mind, washing all thoughts away, leaving harmony. And this is the second. The light of the sun giving new energy, releasing my sorrows. So that's the uh, amount of poems I'll have to hear and for the next month. Satisfies you for a while? You're good now. You're good now. Ten-year-old David is now very happy. I read those ahead of time. I'm impressed. <laughs> I was trying to work out what these sorrows were that I was referring to at the age of 10. I think it was just because I was at school all the time and having to work really hard. I really like how somehow old teachers came back into our lives both this past week, if you want to call it that. I was down at Notre Dame and ran into an old professor and when I was at Notre Dame, listeners, you kind of somewhat know my story, some of you guys, but I wasn't, I was exploring faith. I was trying to find truth. I was trying to find all of that. Uh, and so I wasn't where I am today. And definitely that really came about two years after college. But long story short, I ran a professor and just told him, I really appreciated how you'd always start with an Our Father, glory being a Hail Mary. And he just had a reverence to him and a deep devotion and a love for faith in Christ. So I told him that. We talked for an hour, hour and a half. It was great to catch up. Lovely. Yeah. Well, let's crack on then. Uh, First of all, the song of the week. And I gotta say, this was actually really hard this week. So 
Last week when we did letter eight, Screwtape told us about the law of undulation, how the patient's affections wax and wane. Uh, so I named the episode after the Red Hot Chili Peppers song Love Roller Coaster, since roller coasters go up and down. And today with letter nine, Screwtape explains how to exploit the trough periods, the low points in the patient's life. And so I initially thought I would name today's episode, uh, It Must Have Been Love, But It's Over Now, after the 80s classic from Roxette, which appeared on the Pretty Woman soundtrack. But then I was at church this morning and I was thinking about today's episode and about the patient's vulnerability during these trough periods. So... In the end, I decided it would be better to name today's episode after a song from a different soundtrack. The movie is Top Gun, starring Tom Cruise, and the song is Danger Zone by Kenny Longins. Yes, I've seen it, David. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I know you're thinking it. I know you're thinking it. Let's get that out of the way, and then I can compliment. This is a great song choice. I like this better than the other one because the It Must Have Been Love is would address one of the sub points that we're going to talk about the sexual temptation that can you can fall into in this chapter but really i think the the bigger theme is you're in a danger zone and that's the whole point you're vulnerable to all pleasures being exploited in the wrong way in the wrong degree to whatever the other wrong was i think there's three usually <laughs> and so anyways i think danger zone was a great choice i've not actually i don't remember the song though from it highway to the oh, danger yeah. zone <laughs> There you go, listeners. I just said that so he would sing it. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, it's funny that you actually took that reference to it must have been love uh, as to sexual temptation. The, the love I actually had in mind was the, the love of first conversion because yeah. one of the things that Screwtape is going to play off is the fervor of the patient's initial conversion and the fact that he might feel like he's lost it. Wow. That's it. That's fascinating how we both got two different things because, yeah, I was thinking of the fact that in your down state you turn to – pleasures thinking they're going to make you feel good and a lot of times you're you're seeking a good you're like you're feeling crappy and you're seeking love in a sexual way and you're not realizing this isn't really love this is a perverted state this is lust this is and it leads you just empty so look at that david well we're getting ahead of ourselves what's the quote of the week yeah i like this because it also somewhat plays off from last week's letter of how long story short in my own journeys i mentioned that just the knowing that you're in the state of undulation and getting out of it can be really helpful and therapeutic. So I liked it for that reason. So here it goes. Do not let him suspect the law of undulation. Let him assume that the first ardors of his conversion might have been expected to last and ought to have lasted forever, and that his present dryness is an equally permanent condition. It's so true. That's the temptation, and that's the danger. And you have to know it will cycle. Absolutely. But before... We, we keep trying to, I keep trying to bring us into the chapter because it's such a good one. Let's go to the drink of the week. We actually, David, the last time we did this, because I remember buying the tasting set for it was New York. I had to go find this. This was actually very early on in my time in New York too, because I had to go find a liquor store. I didn't know where these were. So this is going to be Glen Morangi Nectar Dior. 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 <laughs> All right. First, we're going to try this before I read any of the tasting notes because I have actually not read them. And let's just see what we get now that we're starting to become, I almost said experts. That's not the case. Now that we're trying to become <laughs> beginners. Andrew, help. <laughs> yeah, I know. Got what it. do you think on the nose? It's honestly got a burn. You feel it. Yeah, it's not particularly floral. Nope. There's, there's some light sweetness to it. But yeah, I don't get much else. It's got a lightness. No, yeah. Let's take, take a sip. Mm, that's got a pepperiness to it. Mm -hmm. Pretty warm. A lot of it's at the front of your tongue. Very gold, by the way. Medium finish. Oh, yeah, I like that. Medium finish. It's medium, but it doesn't really last that long. So not medium. <laughs> you're saying that's short. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. Well, in these tasting notes, they always have to reference something strange, like, oh, it reminds me of mint chocolate chip ice cream. Dang so it. you you got to come up with something. Dang it, David. First word I see here, body, medium. <laughs> well done. <laughs> uh, lemony gold color. Uh, actually, soft fruit and spice. I got the peppery. I kind of peppery spice. I kind of think I, mm -hmm. I, I got that all right. Palette, uh, gingerbread, custard, raisins, dates, lemony notes, long and spicy. More or less, that's the tasting notes. 
I get part of that. I mean, we genuinely got kind of the peppery, spicy. You got the medium together. I'd say we got 40% of those words. Uh, I, I still contend a lot of this stuff is made up. Whenever I'm drinking with people who haven't drunk scotch before, they'll all say, I, 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 don't know how to, I don't know how to describe it. It's like, just use whatever words, because so many of these tasting notes that we read are just fiction. Like the, the dried grass in a sand dune or the cinnamon roll, <laughs> the frosting of a cinnamon roll or something. I'm like, what is that? No, it tastes like scotch. Yes. As we're doing the drink, though, with that comes our Patreon toast. And this one is for our gold level supporter, Cindy Keen. And so given that this chapter is about spiritual troughs and as we learned last week with the highs and the lows and what God's trying to do and what Satan's kind of do, I want our toast to be around that. So Cindy, we don't know exactly what states you're in right now in your spiritual journey, but if you're in a spiritual trough or if you experience one in the future, we pray it's an opportunity to grow closer to the Lord and to become one of his dearest friends. Cheers. Cheers. In case, Cindy, you didn't listen to last week's episode, the dearest friends reference is how it was at Screwtape or was it one of your letters that actually, because you brought in some quotes from letters, where Lewis writes that God lots of times lets his dearest and closest friends go through the troughs because that's how they become saints. It's in the letter itself. Good. Good. All right, David. Well, let's move on to the chapter summary. Letter 9 was first published in The Guardian on the 27th of June, 1941. And here is my 100-word summary. Screwtape explains how to exploit the trough periods in the patient's life. Distorted sensual temptations during this time can be effective due to the patient's weak defenses. Another strategy is to make the patient assume the slump is permanent. If a pessimist, he must be kept away from Christians and scripture and instead attempt to reclaim his initial fervor through sheer willpower. If an optimist, he should be taught to be content with the trough and even come to doubt his initial fervor. Alternatively, the patient must assume that the current dullness must somehow mean that his faith is false. This, these letters are hitting way too close to home, David. Lewis is doing his Lewisian thing that eventually converted me to Christianity back in Oxford, where I read everything and I go, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. It's killing me. And so for listeners, if you, if, if you didn't hear last week's episode, this, by the way, that letter was very inspiring, deeply um, connected and moved with me. And so I'm very excited for this one because they're really kind of part one and part two. So just know that these past two letters very much go together. And we're going to see a lot today of how Satan attempts to use the tross. Where last week, we learned a lot about the inspiring nature of how God actually can use the tross. And so I left that being very inspired. But what I like about this letter is it tapers it and goes, all right, that's the good that can come from it. But guess what? There is a role that we play of, of entering into that, or I don't want to say making that a reality, but it can also be a dangerous spot. And we have to also be aware of that. So that's what this week's letter is. And if you recall... Last week's letter began because one would thought that the patient's downturn in his religious fervor was due to Wormwood's own efforts. But Screwtape explained that, no, no, it's just to do with the law of undulation. The idea that humanity's temporal nature, the fact that we exist in time, means that we are in a constant state of change. And as a result, the patient's interest in his work, his affection for his friends, his physical appetites, and his faith all go up and down with peaks and troughs. And so Screwtape begins today's letter with a brief recap. He says, I hope my last letter has convinced you that the trough of dullness or dryness through which your patient is going at present will not of itself give you his soul, but needs to be properly exploited. What forms the exploitation should take, I will now consider. So what should one would concentrate on during these trough periods according to Screwtape? Well, he says that they are excellent times for sensual temptations, particularly related to sex. And Screwtape says that women might find this surprising because, after all, wouldn't the exuberance and appetite of the peak periods be more fruitful? But he says, you must remember that the powers of resistance are also at their highest in the peak periods. The attack has a much better chance of success when the man's whole inner world is drab and cold and empty. My own personal experience backs this up 110%. When you are, and, and the reason is, 
it's amazing. Again, this is what Lewis does. He knows human nature. I, I believe the connection to causality. I'm a person that likes causality. Is when you are down, you're feeling when you're feeling despair, down in the dumps. You're just not feeling a lot of joy and pleasure. So, what is the natural thing to do? It's to turn to escapist behaviors to make yourself feel good. And so, why does he say particularly those of sex? Well, sex is probably one of the most beautiful things between a man and a wife in marriage, in the marital bed, in an incredible way. It's a gift. And honestly, we also know from a dopamine hit, it gives you like the biggest, it's like crack cocaine practically. Um, And so of course, it's going to be the thing you turn to to make yourself feel good. And so it's a big struggle. But when when you're actually experiencing genuine joy in life, you're not tempted by those escapist behaviors. And I actually was listening to a podcast recently where Thomas Aquinas talks about a defense mechanism against when you're in these down states is to actually try to seek out good pleasures. So he talks about good sleep, taking a bath and a glass of wine. wine. And I like that. I heard that on the Pints of the Quietness podcast where literally take a bath because if you're not experiencing a lot of those simple pleasures in life, you're going to desire to go to escapist behaviors. Just, just take a bath, have a glass of wine. The, the ladies who do that have it right. They figured it out. The, us men need to take a chapter out of that book. And Screwtape even says that this is sensuality in general, not just sex. Because for me, I am a comfort eater. And mm-hmm. I, I eat when I'm upset, when I feel nervous. And it's because I want to feel happy now. And I know if I scale off down a bunch of sweet food, I'm going to feel happy very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. And this is why, I mean, I've, I've struggled with sexual temptation and, tried to f- and been fighting this and these battles and stuff in this period. But it's so much more than that. And I like how you bring that up. Like, when I go to confession, it, a lot of times it can be for, I'll come back and you just watch TV or you'll have a couple of drinks and, and one or two too many, or you'll just like eat a bunch of comfort food. It really takes tons of different forms and some seem a little bit healthier than other ones. Sexual, I think is the more extreme one that we know is like, oh, this is a sin, but I'll go and I'll essentially just go to confession, talk about slothfulness. I just was lazy and I ordered a pizza, had three drinks, watched a movie and just vegged out. And that can be dangerous when you do it too much. It's because all of these things, they function as painkillers. And mm-hmm. that's actually a word that Lewis uses in a section that people might not recognize. He talks about anodyne and it's a painkiller. And he says, it's much easier to say push drink on a, on a drunkard when he's feeling dull and weary rather than when he's happy and celebrating with his friends. Yep. And I can relate to that. Now, there's one interesting thing he mentions, though, related to sex. He says, if you tempt your man with sex during, during these trough periods, it's much less likely to lead to love. Uh, and <laughs> it's always funny when Screwtape is speaking about something beautiful because you, you can hear the venom in, in his voice and it's just turning his stomach. He writes, trough sexuality is subtly different in quality than that of the peak, much less likely to lead to the milk and water phenomenon which humans call being in love much more easily drawn into perversions, much less contaminated by those generous and imaginative and even spiritual concomitants, which often render human sexuality so disappointing. And here, Screwtape is hinting at something he is going to expand on later, about the nature of pleasure and pleasure in things like food, drink, and in this case, sex. All right, Andy, Guy kiss or what? I don't know. Circus. Circus. I was close. That was impressive, David. Well done. Thanks. Yeah. It's, it's, I can also uh, I completely confirm that. It's just the belief that the sexual stuff will, will bring you any sort of joy. It's the most, it's, it's just, no. I mean, I can't obviously speak to uh, what you can speak to, the joy and the beauty of, of the right orientation of it. Because I'm not married yet and I haven't had it. <laughs> but I assume it's great. I'll just say marriage is awesome and move on. <laughs> <laughs> and Screwtape ends this section by saying something that really shocked me when I first read this book a couple of decades ago. And yes, I really am that old. Screwtape seems to regard all pleasure as something that is dangerous for hell. It's not necessarily good. He writes, never forget that when we are dealing with any pleasure in its healthy and normal and satisfying form, we are, in a sense, on the enemy's ground. I know we have won many a soul through pleasure. All the same, 
It is his invention, not ours. He made the pleasures. All our research so far has not enabled us to produce one. Isn't that crazy? We so often think about pleasures as being something dangerous and sinful. But Screwtape seems to blame God entirely. But Screwtape has read his St. Augustine, so he explains to his nephew what he must do. And long-time listeners to this podcast will have heard us say something like this very often. Here's Screwtape's version of it. All we can do is to encourage the humans to take the pleasures which our enemy has produced at times, in ways, or in degrees which he has forbidden. Hence, we always try and work away from the natural condition of any pleasure to that in which it is least natural, least redolent of its maker, and the least pleasurable. Screwtape actually wants pleasure to be diminishing. He says, to get the man's soul and give him nothing in return. That is what really gladdens our father's heart. And the troughs are the time for beginning the process. And this is what you said in, one, in our, that video series that we did in the beginning, our very first video series. I'll never forget this. It made me chuckle. And I, I actually believe you said it off the cusp, even though we had prepped for those. But you, but you go, we were talking about God and Christianity and teaching and rules. And you go, God's not just sitting upstairs looking down at you, seeing David having fun and going, you know what, I'm going to send down a tablet and say, thou shalt not. Like, that's, <laughs> not what he's, he's, that's not what he's doing. He's, he's actually saying, you know what, I see David going a little too far. Or more likely, I see Matt going a little bit too far. And so I want, him to be like able to experience, <laughs> I want him to be able to experience the fullness of this. The, the, the full, what he's looking for, he's just looking for it in a little bit of the wrong way. So I want to let him know how he experiences what he's truly trying to seek. Therefore, now I'm going to send down the thou shalt not. It's for our own good. Christian teaching, Christian rules, theology, the things that help us understand how we live in relation to creation and to others and to God are for our own sake. They are for joy in beauty. If you think about any appliance, it usually comes with an instruction manual that tells you how to use it, how to get the most out of it. And we've, I think we've all experienced, particularly men, I would say, we've all experienced what happens when we don't bother reading the book and we have our own attempts at how we think this will best work. I never read the book. <laughs> of course you don't. <laughs> uh, but that last bit that Screwtape talks about is, is quite shocking where he says okay not only do I think that pleasures are good things that come from God and we need to distort it in some way he says but it's our goal we don't actually want the humans experiencing too much pleasure at all we want to get everything from him and give him as little in return as possible and, and Lewis, Lewis explains this idea more explicitly in The Four Loves where he says that a temperate man will enjoy an occasional glass of wine as a treat. And in contrast, the alcoholic gains very little from that glass of wine, except a brief relief from his cravings. And I believe, going back to what I mentioned earlier with Thomas Aquinas, the reason he doesn't want us to experience pleasures is honestly, if you're going through a life experiencing genuine pleasures, and I want to preface it that because I think it's very easy for us to think of pleasures ironically in a negative way in today's society, genuine pleasures, a great book, a great hike, cooking, these types of things that fill you up, you don't want to do negative stuff. Like when you're, you're in that state, you actually are just much more obedient to God, to your spiritual routines. It's when you aren't experiencing pleasures that the bad behaviors happen, that you genuinely start doing self-destructive, self-sabotaging in a lot of your routines. And I can speak from very personal experience with this. Like that's when it starts happening. And that's when it's very important to Rather than try to, and this is what you were talking about earlier, willing it, you can't just try to sheer will it. I've learned this lesson the hard way. You need God's grace, but you also need uh, Aquinas's suggestions. It's like the sacraments plus some simple things like get some good night's sleep, take a bath, have a glass of wine. You can fill those three in for something else. Go for a hike, cook a good meal, read a great book. We've talked about this before. Do something for the pure pleasure of doing it. And that's hard for me. I sit and I read a book for the sake of I got to finish this or I got to check it off or I got to do this. It's like, just sit down and read a book for pleasure. I have literally next to me Game of Thrones book one because I've heard it's incredible. I'm getting nothing out of it. I haven't seen the movie or the shows. I'm just excited. I've heard really good things about the Game of Thrones books. I'm just going to enjoy it. It's funny you say that because particularly since we've been doing this podcast, a lot of my Lewis reading is for the podcast. Uh, but just earlier this week, I decided to pick up a copy of Out of the Silent Planet and reread it. That's it. Yeah. Well done. Well <laughs> done. 
Although now I'm doing that, I think I'm probably going to restart our local book club and that'll probably be the first book we do. But that's just because I'm trying to be efficient. But it began with just, oh, I'm just going to read this for fun. <laughs> I tried. Oh, that's the point, David. You can't be like, I'm doing this out of efficiency now. I'm glad it started well, but let it end well too. <laughs> let it end well. I, I forbid you for that to be the first book. Okay, well, I will take that into consideration with all the authority that you have in my life. <laughs> So, returning to the latter, the first way of exploiting the trough was through sensual temptation, particularly sex. And Screwtape goes on and gives what he thinks is a superior way of exploiting the trough. And this second way relates to how the patient thinks about the trough itself. And if you recall when we had William O'Flaherty on the show as an interview, uh, he kept on emphasizing about the not only the idea of habits, but about that Screwtape's primary primary tool, primary weapon, is to keep things out of our minds. And in this case, Screwtape doesn't want the patient to be conscious of the fact that he's just in the middle of a very natural ebb and flow of life, that this is the cause for the dullness that he's currently experiencing. Instead, Screwtape wants him to think about the trough in this way. Let him assume that the first ardors of his conversion might have been expected to last and ought to have lasted forever, and that this present dryness is an equally permanent condition. And this was our quote of the week. And this was what I mentioned when I had that confession with the priest, and I just started bawling and saying, like, I just lost hope. It's because I thought it was a permanent condition. This is a very simple way of stating it. The only thing I will add to Lewis and caveat a little bit, I believe as much as you can just be like, all right, this is an undulation and you're in a negative spot. To many degree, to to a meaningful amount, that's true. But I do believe your actions also can contribute to the depth of your trough. And so I believe they can play off themselves. You can get in a trough and then you can start some bad behaviors that because they can actually lead to more physical desolation, that physical desolation can lead to more spiritual desolation, and your spiritual desolation can lead to more physical desolation. And I do believe those can feed off each other. So if you can attempt to fight that in certain ways, you definitely want to do that. So again, I always like to give listeners some personal experiences. For me, in the trough, I knew sexual temptation was going to be a struggle. And so after slipping up a few times, went with some buddies, covenant eyes, locked out all like pornography, masturbation stuff from my computers and just put that into place because I knew that this could feed off itself. This could be bad. I'm not in a good spot. Need to do this. It was a very technical thing. And it just helps because then that can't feed and you've locked that away. I also, like I think I mentioned before, bought the iPad so I can leave my computer at um, the office and my iPad doesn't allow me to watch TV because it doesn't have a browser or like Netflix on it. So I can't fall into those negative behaviors that make me feel even more like crap. Coming home and vegging out. You don't wake up the next morning and be like, huh, I really used last night really great watching two movies. <laughs> so it forces me to read the book. So I do think there's practical stuff as well. And I do want to sh- suggest that there's a natural amount of trough and amount your behaviors might be contributing to. The image that comes to my mind as you're talking about that is, say you fell overboard at sea uh, and you're in a storm. The waves are coming up and down. Sometimes you'll be lifted up to the peak. Sometimes you'll be down in the trough. But even if you're down in the trough, you keep treading water. <laughs> if you stop yes. treading water, it's going to get far worse, far more quickly. <laughs> yes. I'm still treading. <laughs> in fact, I'm paddling up. <laughs> but the main thing that Screwtape wants to ram home here is two errors. That the initial ardor of conversion should last forever. That's false. And secondly, that the dryness that the patient is currently in will also equally last forever. And Screwtape wants to exploit these misconceptions and these misunderstandings and these falsehoods in different ways, depending upon whether the patient is an optimist or a pessimist. Interestingly, Screwtape thinks that pessimists are becoming rarer. It's not my personal opinion uh, or observation, but whatever. But he says, if the guy's a pessimist, he says they're much easier to handle. You have only got to keep him out of the way of experienced Christians, an easy task nowadays, to direct his attention to the appropriate passages in scripture, and then to set him to work on the desperate design of recovering his old feelings by sheer willpower, and the game is ours. Matt, why do you think he particularly needs to keep him away from experienced Christians? Well, 
I think twofold. First, <laughs> actually first, this was actually what when I was talking to the professor, we were talking about friends you surround yourself with and they can pull you up. I actually think, I don't, maybe he doesn't refer to this specifically, but I do believe this is true. You become the average of those you're around. So if you're around experienced Christians, that actually really helps you in a troth period because you are, even if you're in a troth, then they're doing good behaviors and modeling good behaviors that will pull you up. Probably the more important reason, though, he's talking about is they can help you understand an experienced Christian that this God could be permitting this, good can come out of this, give you tips. They can help you get through it intellectually. So if we think back to what was the paragraph before, he was telling you, don't even let you realize it intellectually, more or less. Well, an experienced Christian will point it out. So I could come to you and David, and I could be like, I'm really struggling for X, Y, Z. I'm in a downstate. I mean, scratch that. Let me take a step back and say the priest was the experienced Christian. I go in, I tell him I'm in this state. I literally poured my heart out and essentially explained it. And he shot it down, gave me hope, said he's going to pray for me, made me believe it, explained some tools I could do, and essentially helped me understand that I don't need to lose hope and I don't have to be in a state of despair. So I actually think that's the exact example. The Christian is what the experienced Christian, the priest, helped pull me out and recognize this is a trough, not a permanent condition. Because experienced Christians have usually been through that themselves. I don't think you can really even become an experienced Christian until you've had multiple trough periods. And you then have the experience to be able to look back and say, this happened to me. Don't worry, you'll come out of it. I'm hoping I come out of it. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully I'm still an experienced Christian on the other side. (laughs) (laughs) The reference to scripture I thought was rather interesting. What do you think Screwtape was saying here? Was he saying that the to keep him out of the way of experienced Christians who will direct his attention to passages of scripture? Or is he saying that what you need to do with your patient is keep him away from Christians and point him to certain passages in scripture and then set about regaining his old feelings through sheer willpower? I got the sense of the latter. Whether I was right or wrong in the way, the reason I thought that was because let's pretend you're an isolated person and you're reading scripture and you're reading these passages that reminded you of the past and you're trying to get back there, it can very quickly just put you back in the past. And the whole point that I've taken away from the last letter and this letter, and you actually really helped me with it last week, is stop looking backward and try to go forward. Realize this jungle you're going through is teaching you something to bring you to another state, an equally beautiful state, if not slightly more beautiful state. And so I feel like just going to the scripture, sometimes it's like, I got my one verse and I'm going to put it on my, my mirror in my where I brush my teeth in the morning, it's going to remind me of some good feel-good quote, and thus it's going to help me get back to where I was through willpower. That's how I interpreted it. Whether that was right, I don't know. I think that can definitely be a real trap. I, I'm going to lean towards, I think this is what Screwtape is saying. Get him, get your patient to think about a passage of scripture, such as you know any of St. Paul's exhortations to faith. Uh, but then, once again, distort it, much like in prayer, Let him take the exhortation to faith to the exhortation to generate feelings of faith. Mm, I like that. Generate feelings. I think that's correct. Because if this guy gets in contact with experienced Christians, they will themselves send him to scripture because that's what you should always do. (laughs) But they'll send him to scripture and they'll remind him that what you're experiencing is entirely expected. Uh, I've been reading a lot of First Peter recently. And Peter is writing to a church that's suffering and even says, don't be surprised when all of this ordeal comes upon you as though something strange were happening to you. It's like this, that's what we said last time, the suffering is going to happen one way or the other, but particularly if you're a Christian. And, you know, we follow a master who said, if you want to be my disciple, you've got to take up your cross and follow me. And let's not forget when he says, send them to the appropriate passages in scripture, He's not referring to truly appropriate in the way that we're thinking of it. He's referring to it, the the ones that could be taken out of context and we can manipulate to make him believe a certain thing. So they're actually the not appropriate. And I, I hesitate to say that word because I doubt there's any like inappropriate passage, but he knows that in the... There are, there are inappropriate passages, but <laughs> <laughs> just read through Song of Songs. Uh, That's true. Well, uh, it's, it's just the usual screw tape protocol. It's about twisting things. You know, the one thing we know is that Satan can quote scripture in the temptation of the desert. This is one thing we find out. Scripture is very good at quoting scripture. I think I've commented earlier this season, uh, I saw an inspirational poster. It says, worship me and I will give you the world. And it's like, 
that's not inspirational when you find out who said it. That was Satan. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot, I've been following that my whole life. <laughs> I thought he said, give me, you know, I thought he said, give me yourself and I'll give you everything. Yeah. Just as an aside, for today's Skype session, I'm going to be reading a letter which Lewis wrote to someone who was suffering. So I'm not sure whether it was Wormwood or Screwtape assigned to that person, but they failed in their job because this person gets some advice from an experienced Christian, in this case, Lewis. But pulling this section together for the pessimistic patient, Screwtape wants the patient to try and white-knuckle it. He wants him to just, just, just will himself back into feeling the same way he did after he just converted. And the thing is, that's, that's just not, that's not good advice. Well, not if you're on the side of heaven at any rate. Because no matter how great your will is, you will only ever be able to take so much before your will is just going to fail. You know, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, and Lewis actually gave us this advice all the way back in season one. In Mere Christianity, he says, it's no good to trying to keep any thrill. That is the very worst thing you can do. Let the thrill go. Let it die away. Go on through that period of death into the quieter interest and happiness that follows, and you'll find that you are living in a world of new thrills all the time. It's, it's only when we try and live in the past that everything goes wrong. And I'd like to make a comment about that white knuckling because that goes back to mere Christianity, that goes back to theosis, the new man, divinization. This, this will be coming more from the denominations of a sacramental background, which is not just a Catholic denomination. But um, for me, it was a really great realization when I came to understand that I can't do this from a white knuckle perspective. And when I say I came to understand, it means I don't always fully follow that. I still fall back into the trap of white knuckling. That's my natural personality is a type A, type three Enneagram type person, all of this. Like I'm going to, I'm going to will it. I'm going to discipline. I'm going to do it. And it was only when I realized I couldn't do that. And I was dependent on the sacraments and God's grace that's transmitted through them and his healing power and Holy Spirit that I've ever been able to overcome things. And some of the greatest victories, if you want to call them that, in my own life of discipline and sin and vices and temptations have always been through the power of prayer or the sacraments and God's grace and the Holy Spirit. Never in the last five years have they been the white knuckling. And I've had a few priests point out to me as I go to confession about certain things that I, I almost still need to fully learn that lesson. I think I know it about 60%, but I fall back into the temptation of white knuckling and it's almost like God allows me to screw up to recognize, Matt, when are you going to get over this stupid view that you can white knuckle it? Because you absolutely can't. And just let that go and give it to me. It's been a hard lesson to learn. And sometimes I wonder if I learn it sooner, I won't have to go through some of these periods quite as much. (laughs) But nevertheless, alas, I'm here. (laughs) So we've now covered the approach if the patient is a pessimist. What about if he's an optimist? This is what Screwtape says. If he is of the more hopeful type, your job is to make him acquiesce in the present low temperature of his spirit and gradually become content with it, persuading himself that it is not so low after all. So Screwtape wants him to become content with the trough and never expect there to be a peak ever again. And if you can get him to do that, Screwtape can even get him to begin to doubt the initial fervor of his conversion. He says in a week or two, you'll be making him doubt whether or not his initial conversion was a little excessive. Screwtape writes, talk to him about moderation in all things. A moderated religion is as good for us as no religion at all, and more amusing. Doesn't it sound like a little bit at first a lose-lose? When you're, when you're reading this, a different example he gives, well, you can't go white knuckle it, stop being an optimist, don't go look back this way. I was reading this, and I'm like, it seems like a lose-lose, but I've, when I took a step back and read it in more depth, I teased out, I feel like looking backwards at the high is not a bad thing. Like desiring that is a good thing. Like the reason I believe God gave it mm-hmm. to us is so we recognize when we surrender to his will, we do experience a beauty and a joy. But the key is, to rather than going back to the same methods to recognize that you need to go through this period of obedience out of not the feeling, but out of pure obedience. And then when you come to the other side, you will probably experience, I don't want to say a high, but a very, almost like a slow burn of peace and joy. So it's, it's not, again, that that's a bad thing when you're going backwards. It's just recognizing the method is to go forwards, actually, into a new and different high. 
So you still maintain the hope. Like I still have this hope that what I experienced in 2015 to 17, these are rough years, of just this incredible high, that 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 was a good thing and there will be a point in my life where I do experience the peak again. It's not going to be that same peak, but I do believe mm-hmm. desiring the peak is a nice thing and there's there there's a reason for it. And also not trying to just to simply will it. Don't think that you can manufacture it by yourself. Yes. You helped me with that last week. What I'm trying to understand and recognize is except you don't know when it's going to come. You don't mm-hmm. know how if it's I could be one week away, I could be 10 years away from it. But what I need to do right now is know that God is working in this period and find actually the subtle joy and beauty of this period in this moment and the opportunity and the purpose, which does bring a sense of hope, to remain obedient, to learn the lessons, and to trust and to still maintain that optimism. Like, I kind of like to be the optimistic patient, that this will come. It's just give it some time. And it's in God's time, not yours. Yes. And in theory, I guess, Lord willing, hopefully not. It could never be in this side of the earth. (laughs) That would suck. (laughs) It would suck. And there have been some of God's favorites that seem to experience the latter part of their life like that, like Mother Teresa of Calcutta. I know. She experienced a, a prolonged dark night of the soul towards the end of her life. But she was faithful. She was faithful throughout. And now she's with all of the other angels and saints before the throne of God. Mm, That's my problem, my Mother Teresa. Dang it. (laughs) Just kidding, guys. Screwtape offers one last method of attack. And this is a little bit more direct. He says, you can be a bit more overt. He says, when you have caused him to assume that this trough is permanent. So if you recall, this was, this is like the foundational principle for most of Screwtape's attack. The patient has to think, okay, this is never going to change. He says, can you not persuade him that his religious phase is just going to die away like all the previous phases? What's funny about this is Screwtape points out this isn't actually logical. He says, there is no conceivable way of getting by reason from the proposition, I am losing interest in this, to the proposition, this is false. Mm. As I said before, it is jargon, not reason you must rely on. And that's a question I often ask when someone brings up an objection or more, more usually a difficulty in the Christian life. It's like Christianity, Christ calls me to do this and it's really difficult. And so I just don't think I'm going to be a Christian anymore. It's like, does that somehow mean that Jesus didn't walk out of his tomb? Because honestly, that's the only reason not to be a Christian. The only reason not to be a Christian is if Jesus Christ died and never came back. But if he walked out of his tomb, then that changes everything. And I want to add a nuance here because I actually don't experience this. I've experienced plenty of other stuff that Lewis writes. What I experience, but I do think is related to this line of reasoning, so maybe other listeners can relate to this. When I've been in these trust periods now, and maybe going back to 2011, although those were different when I was in Oxford because there I never had the peak beforehand, I don't doubt whether it's real or not. I have not had that. What I doubt was my genuineness during the troth which is a little bit of a different nuance. It's like, I actually still believe he walked out of the tomb. I'm questioning whether I have the ability to surrender to it um, or if my pride and ego is too big. I wonder if that period in St. Bridget's in San Diego, when you're surrounded by people, it was just easy. Of course, you're the average of the people you're around, but now that you're tested without that, you can't hold it. Those are the doubts I'm having. Not, it does, it's not real, it doesn't exist, God doesn't exist. I haven't had that in the slightest. But it's still related. It's a nuance, I would say. It's my realness almost. And I think that's a real trap because you sound like St. Peter trying to walk on water and looking down at the waves and thinking that he can't do it. He can't walk on water. Mm -hmm. The point at which he could do it was when he had his eyes fixed on Jesus. Which goes back to just what I was saying earlier with the sacraments. And for me, I didn't even quote that specific, but daily mass. When I continue to go to that and stay faithful to that, which is keeping my eyes on his presence, that's when I am able to walk. That's when I'm able to. And the problem, though, is Satan, I think, (laughs) I think, I know, is learning this. And he keeps, he finds ways to keep me away from that. It's like, okay, I can go Tuesdays and Thursdays, or I can go Wednesday. It's like, I want to always make sure there's another one outside of the weekend. But there's always reasons, excuses. He finds these ways because that's the thing. You keep me away from that, and everything falls apart. If I go, everything falls into place. Yeah. It's all about where your focus is. Yes. And 
we're right back to everything that Screwtape has said. About, well, actually, no, we haven't done that bit yet. But when Screwtape talks about humility, it's oh, actually no, he has the Screwtape has also spoken about when your patient is praying, let him be spending more time thinking about his own state of mind rather than the God to whom he thinks he's praying. I will say, oh, now I'm about to kill myself. <laughs> I'm going to say it because listeners will laugh and you're going to laugh. Um, I will say this whole period has just destroyed my pride and brought a lot of humility. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, I knew the second that thought came into my mind, but I'm like, I have lost all belief in my ability to do these things without God. <laughs> It's like, by Jove, I be, believe I'm being humble. <laughs> I knew it right when it came to my thought. This is why I keep you around, David. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then let's just wrap up the letter. Screwtape has a few words about the philology department of hell, doing lots of good work with the word phase. He says that people have a certain superiority when they feel like they've been through a phase uh, and they see other people, what they see is being in a phase. And they're superior because for that person, it's in the past. And Screwtape says, oh, just feed him lots of hazy ideas of progress and development and the historical point of view. Uh, give him lots of modern biographies because people on those are often emerging from phases. But here we tie into a, 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 an idea that keeps appearing in Lewis's work, this idea of progress uh, and, and phase and moving on and moving forward. Uh, and as he said in Mere Christianity... Progress means getting closer to the place where you want to be. And if you take a wrong turning, you've got to turn back and go and take the right turning. Uh, and likewise, if you are heading on the right road, don't think it's progress to suddenly veer off course. And once again, Screwtape doesn't want him to think about the truth. Only jargon. Don't let him think about true and false. It's all about, it was a phase. I've been through that. And he, he refers to the blessed word, adolescent. And that in particular makes me think of Susan Pevensey for reasons that Matt will find out after we've read The Last Battle. So five years from now? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. I hope listeners, you guys got as much out of these last two letters as I know I did. It's fun being, we're, we're here speaking this, David and I, and well, David is coming more from a place of probably authority and teaching. I'm coming here as just a learner, a student. <laughs> Yeah, I am charging Matt for these sessions. <laughs> well played, David. 70 uh, times 7, is that my, uh, is your $70 an hour? That seems reasonable. No, oh, okay. Reasonable. But let's see what you got for unscrewing screw tape. What do's and don'ts did you come up with from this letter? Yeah, I tried to keep it simple. Don't be fooled into cheap pleasure when you're in the trough. Don't lose hope and believe it's permanent. And then do remind yourself it will pass. That's about the same thing as a don't. And do seek healthy pleasures. That's nice. I like it. I had a few extras. Do remember that you are vulnerable in the troughs. When you're heading into a difficult period of life, let's say, you know, you've got a big project on at work or um, your spouse loses their job or, you know, just anything that's stressful, you, know, you have a new child, whatever it is, know that when you're entering a period of trial, you're going to be vulnerable. God is going to do some amazing stuff with you if you let him. But he's not the only one that wants to shape your character during that time. Yeah, that was like my example with lust and temptations, particularly men and women struggle with pornography. I was like, got to get covenant eyes. I'm in a vulnerable state. Usually I'm pretty, I'm fine with it. And it's not a temptation when I'm doing well in life. And I feel a lot of joy. So buckle up, <laughs> lock it up essentially, and make it that you can't. Another one I got was, don't think that pleasure is wrong. And to quote scripture, do remember that every good and perfect gift comes from God. Uh, that that these, these are his gifts to us. Uh, they just have to be used correctly. One other thing, do build up a community around you. Mm. Remember Screwtape's advice. Don't let this guy hang around experienced Christians because they'll clue him into what's happening. And so that's why you need a community around you to support you, particularly when you're going through a trying time. And remember... So this would be a do. Do remember that neither peaks nor troughs last forever. And it's okay to, in the words of Book of Revelation, remember your first love, to remember your initial honeymoon period with God, um, and to seek that again. But remember, you're seeking a gift 
It's going to be in relationship. It's not something that you can just will yourself into. And, and you might receive that gift in a different way. Yes. Almost certainly, in fact. Yes. I'm still waiting to see what the other way is like. <laughs> and I had one last one. Do think clearly. And that relates to that, that final section where the patient is encouraged to think that, well, because he's had a downturn in his faith, his fervor is, is lessening. Well, the, the, it, it all just can't be true. Think clearly. One does not imply the other. No more so than uh, a relationship with a girlfriend or a spouse goes through a difficult period means that, um, that there's nothing there. What, what is required of you in that time is your will, be your commitment to that person, and to treat that person with grace. It doesn't simply mean that because th things are hard, this should immediately be abandoned. I love this screw tape unscrewed section. <laughs> well, as we wrap this up, we want to remind people, we don't sometimes we forget to do this part, but remind you guys, check out our YouTube channel, Twitter, Instagram. So if people used to watch some of our YouTube videos last season, David brings incredible guests on there. Sadly, I mean, fortunately, blessedly, we've come to a point where we can't always fit some of these people in our normal podcast routine. Thus, some of the high quality after hours that you would expect that would be dropped onto here, get dropped onto the Skype session. And so definitely go subscribe that, turn the notifications on. We still have a fraction of the people we have on here listening on our YouTube channel. So check that out. And our graphics have gone to another level. David's continued his high quality ones. We have a wonderful person named Brittany that's been putting some high quality ones. Our do's and don'ts get on Instagram. So everything, all these different channels are actually becoming wonderful and independent almost in their own right. But they're all still related. So I don't think there's much more to say apart from to thank our top tier supporters, Jeff, Chris, John, Kate, and Rowdy. And join us next time when we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers, my friend.